guess what? This is not my house. <laughs> I'm not in my house today because we tried that earlier this week and it was a disaster. It did not work. And I didn't want to risk having a repeat of that today. So I'm hanging out in the studio. I've got Sam online helping and Scott's online helping answer, uh, get me the questions that show up in the chat so that I can try to answer as many of them as I possibly can for you. Um, yes. I'm remembering social distancing. There's nobody close to me right now. I am safe. And we are good. And I'm really excited to be hanging out with you all today. Um, it's Friday. The sun is shining. I had a smoothie bowl for lunch. And also, um, I have had my afternoon coffee. So we are going to have a great time. Um, so I really wish this were my house. Sometimes I think about, you know, I could just, like, live in the piano set. Because at the office, we have, like... We have all the things here at the office, at, at the studio, so I could technically live here if I wanted to. But there's no windows in this room, so I might get depressed from lack of sunshine. Um, you should definitely not be sitting this way when you are practicing piano. This is, this is incorrect seating. I will, I will show you the right way to sit when you play the piano in just a moment. <laughs> oh, heavens. Okay, I am really excited to, to see all of you. So the whole point of this is to, well, obviously to hang out, but I wanted to talk about some really simple ways that you can make beautiful sounds on the piano so that if you're potentially kind of unable to go out, you know, the whole quarantine and self-isolation and all the other words that I can't remember right now that mean you have to stay home, you have something that you can do at the piano. And so whether you're a complete beginner that has no training whatsoever and you're you don't know, or you're somebody that's more advanced, um, you'll have something to play. And I find that, like, you know, a lot of the classically trained players, um, when it comes to improvising, I was one of them, we just kind of go, what? How do we do that? So even if you've got some experience, there might be something here for you. And then, of course, I'll open it up to questions. We'll answer questions. If you have song requests, throw them at me. I'll pick the ones that I know, and I'll sing or play them for you. Ah, we have a friend from Bermuda here. Ah, this is so nice. Okay, so let's talk about some ways we can make some beautiful sounds on the piano. And I was thinking today we should do some, some work with the sus chord. Because sus chords are magic. First, let's create a C chord. So this is like the number one first chord that you learn when you're learning chords. Take your right hand one finger, place it on C. Skip a note, so this guy's not gonna play. Place your third finger down, skip this guy, and then place your five finger down. So what we have here is a C chord, and if you're at your piano and you're just doing this, you can create something really pretty. Um, but it gets boring after a very short period of time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of this third tone, and we're gonna swap it for the second. And this is called a suspended chord. And suspended chords are called that, well, I'm sure there's a really technical reason that Sam can type in the chat, but I call them suspended because they feel like suspenseful, like you're suspended, like the chord is not finished. Sam, do you agree? Yes, from a social distance he agrees with me. Um, so we call this suspended chord because it feels like it's, it's taking you somewhere but you're not really sure where. And if you're playing on a chord chart, you're gonna see this as a C to represent the chord, sus, S-U-S, two. So here's why these are cool, watch this. epic and pretty. I'm not even changing what I'm playing with my right hand. I'm just playing this suspended chord. It just creates this sense of mystery. And then, if you resolve it and come back to your C chord, it's like, oh, we're home. So when you combine them, this works really well if you have to play background music at church or, um, you know, if you've ever played a wedding. One time I played a wedding was the like music that was happening while they were waiting for the wedding to start and the bride was one hour late so after I had already played for a good f half an hour she was an additional hour late and I had to play just noodling stuff for a whole hour it was so difficult so this is what I did <laughs> a lot of <laughs> so once you have this like try a thing and then you go to the sus two um, you can start to explore by breaking it up and 
here's what I mean. So what if you were to play your C chord broken like this? Anybody can do this with a little bit of practice. And then what if you were to play that sus chord in a broken way? And then you can go back to this. before we start to explore uh, kind of how to build this out, is you can actually swap this third triad tone for the four. And that gives you what's called a sus four. So it's also a suspended chord. It's really useful for ending a song, I find, because it creates this like, what's happening? Oh yeah, there we are. So you can do this. There's your sus four. Chord, and there's your sus too. So one chord and boom, you're playing all kinds of magic. So this is where you get to kind of really do some exploring and having fun because you could travel around with your left hand. So I'm playing in the key of C. So what that means is my ingredients, the notes that are gonna sound good are all the white keys because that's what is in the key signature of C. So if I'm playing, C sus2, why don't I try exploring some different notes with my left hand? So let's try G. Right? This is where the mystery starts to build. Let's try A. And let's try F. And I'm just hitting octaves. Now let's switch to that sus4, and we'll go back to C. And there's the G. but you can explore with the entirety of the scale. And then to take this to another key is so, so simple. Because if you just look at another key signature, let's do G for a second. You figure out your scale. This is why scales are so important because scales give us the ingredients for everything that we want to do. I never understood this when I was practicing scales and I was just like, oh, oh this is just a thing you do. It never kind of occurred to me that there was a reason. <laughs> um, but. If you know a scale, then you have everything that you need in order to play music in that key signature. So if you look at the key of G, it's all white keys except for F. F is a black key, it's F sharp. Um, so you could do the same thing. So here's my G chord, here's my G sus2. So let's play that. is typing. Sam's helping answer the questions in the chat. And I'm going to answer a couple of questions now and then we're going to go on to some more stuff. This is totally live. We are live. How do I prove that we're live? I was going to like pinch myself but then I could have done that if we weren't live. But then I couldn't be answering your question if we weren't live. <laughs> pinch myself to prove we're not live. <laughs> this is good. I like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh dear, okay. All right, I'm gonna focus now. Hold up my pinky. There we go. There's the proof, I don't have to pinch myself. Like Dr. Evil. <laughs> um, oh, I was gonna talk about minor scales. Okay, actually this actually works really well because I can take what we just did and we can apply it to minors because, oh, again, minors used to really, I'd get so confused by minors. Um, so I'm gonna teach you about minor scales right now because it's gonna blow your mind. So let's go back to the key of C. So when you have a major scale, you have all the ingredients you need, right, to play your scale. I call them ingredients because I just love food so much. When I say ingredients, I think about food. 
Okay, so C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. That is C major scale. It sounds cheerful, happy. Now, every major scale has a relative minor. And why are they relative? There's some reasons, but what they do share, that we call them relatives because they share characteristics. They use the same exact notes as the major scale, except they start and end on a different note, which gives you a completely different sound. So you can find the relative minor of any major scale by playing up to the sixth note of the major. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That is A. So now, if you start on A and play the exact same notes, all the white keys, you have A minor and So I used a, a, like the minor, the relative minor is my new home base, and that takes everything into a minor key. So I can still play with any of the white keys in my left hand, um, and I like, I mean, I like the sound of just that five tone scale on the A. Right? Just and see what happens. The beautiful thing about exploring, if you can be okay with making mistakes, play things that sound bad, is chances are you'll be like, oh, that sounded bad, and then you don't do it again. And that's how you learn what's gonna sound good. You have to take the chances, and then you just pull that information through, and next thing you know, you're playing awesome stuff. Okay, so, let me just finish talking about minors, because I wasn't quite done. Then you can have different kinds of minors, because it wasn't enough to have just one minor. There have to be more. So what we just talked about was the natural minor. You can play something called the harmonic minor, which sounds really cool. And the harmonic minor has special rules. You raise the seventh note. I just think of like the pop, soda, soda pop, seven up. You raise the seventh. I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's the seventh. So instead of playing this, I'm going to raise it a half step. That's a harmonic minor. I love it. And then you can have the melodic minor, which raises the sixth and the seventh on the way up, and then goes to the natural minor on the way down, which I think is just bananas. I don't like that one very much, but it exists, so it's good to know about it. Okay, I should probably go see what kind of, oh, we got lots of good questions here. Mm -mm. I'm always looking forward to various types of exercises to improve on my finger and hand independence. Also, on moving from one key to another quickly, I hope you could help us with such exercises. Okay, well, um, finger and hand independence, honestly, I really like hand and exercises for that because uh, they <laughs> work on finger independence and I think that um, they're just because of like the repetitious patterns, they're really useful. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a Hannon. We actually have Hannon included in our Faster Fingers pack. I actually think you might really like our Faster Fingers pack because um, they we go through a whole bunch of dexterity and independence exercises with the goal of helping you to develop speed, but also like accuracy and the other aspects of your playing. And it kind of takes you through this step by step with like a 10 minute practice that you do every day. You track your speed, progress is actually really, really good. So the link for that is in the description to this. It's bundled up with all of our other packs right now. So now's a good time to check it out. So Hannon's, here's a good one. I like that one. So I don't remember which number it is, but you, could start on C and then you reach up. So instead of going to the fifth, you go to the sixth. And then you go five, four, five, three, five, two, five. And then look at magically your thumb is on the next note. You reach up. And as you get better at this, you can play it really fast. When you're playing those hands together, you're working on even more of those skills. So I really like that. It takes it to the next level, especially when you're doing things like staccato um, or focusing on different volumes as you go through it, maybe opposing articulations, like your one hand's playing staccato and your other hand's playing legato. That is 
super wild. Um, okay, so this question actually kind of pulls us back to the, um, the beautiful sounds concept. So let's take a look at this. How do you manipulate timings for the chord to make it sound more beautiful? Like it doesn't sound so static. This one's really hard to explain with words. Because when you're learning to play, you want to develop good rhythm. So you want to play with a metronome, and then you get, you know, your steady beat. One, two, three, right? Everything's kind of on time. So if you're playing one, two, three, four, um, actually let's put this, let's, let's do this. Okay, hold on. So let's play. some little hesitations they call that rubato yeah they call that rubato and what it is is it's kind of like you're manipulating time a little bit so you are still staying within your time signature you know you you have kind of like your sections of however many beats per measure but maybe you're going to give a little more to this guy and a little less to this guy and it all evens out in the end um, and what that does is it creates this like sense of tension so as opposed to one two three four one two three four you kind of exaggerated but you just play with just kind of speeding up and slowing down and you'll get a feel for it once you start to experiment for some people they have to be very intentional about you know knowing their beats and then kind of playing before or after them and for others if you just really like hold a big emotion um, and feel whatever it is that you're trying to convey at the piano it kind of just like naturally comes through and you can experience that sometimes a little more easily with like a little bit of a lean in to be expressive with your body because I feel like that's all connected so that's what I think okay going back to the questions okay Ooh, what are some good tools to practice sight reading okay Sorry, so please. Can yes. you uh, mention the name for these questions so like, whoever I was asking Oh, yes, sorry. For? Okay, this Thank is you. from Ashish42. Um, tools. So, and forgive me if they're terribly hard to pronounce. <laughs> I won't forgive you, Taylor. Okay, just, okay, well. There's no forgiveness. Oh, yeah, okay, right. Then you can say them. Um, okay. Tight reading. So this is a panel member asking this question. Um, hello especially in foundations too. So in the piano members area, we have something called the foundations, which walks you through step-by-step step everything you need to know to play the piano. Level two is where we explore sight reading and sight reading is not easy. Um, so there's a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, you can learn everything there is to learn about sight reading. You can know it here, but when you actually have to apply it in real time to playing something, it's, it's a bit more of like a lifelong thing. <laughs> and some of us get it quick and some of us myself it's just always a little bit challenging I tend to really rely on my ear so to keep that in mind um, in order to improve your sight reading just a little bit of daily practice so you can get like you know you, there's apps that have like the little flashcards and stuff um, in the foundations lessons below all of the sight reading lessons there's multiple little practice alongs that you can use to test your sight reading but what I tend to do when I'm working on developing my sight reading is I'll find a book of music that's like five or six levels below where I'm currently playing at and I'll just sight read or play something from that every day. Just spend about five minutes or ten minutes playing something you've never played before or heard. Something that's way easier than what you're capable of because what it does is it makes it a manageable experience and it will it will move you forward with improving. Um, and the piano books have a lot of more information as well on how to sight read and all that. Sight reading made simple is included in the bundle right now that we have in the description um, and that will give you all the basics of sight reading. And again, it's just about learning the information, knowing it, and then being able to apply it as you go. Two different things, take some time. And, and before we go on, I'd just like to mention, oh, do I have reverb in my voice? I do. That's reverb. Okay, that, that was the sound of weird. Um, the first question was from a, a, a Niz, Nizar Fatea. So, so if I can pronounce that one, and I probably didn't, you can pronounce the rest there. All <laughs> right, I can. Okay, and then the second question was Matias. Fernandez. Oh no, I haven't answered that one. I'm getting confused. Nick, Nick Kunj was the second one. Now I'm going to talk about Matias's question, and then we're going to do some more beautiful sounds. 
Okay, what would be my number one advice to someone who wants to find harmony with the melody? Ooh, what is my number one? That's a tricky one. Know your chords. Um, so let's try, what's the song, guys? I know some songs. Oh. This one's always a good one. Hallelujah. Okay. The melody. That's the melody. And if you're reading from a chord chart or a lead sheet, you know that you have a C and then an A minor if you're playing in this key. Um, so if I'm playing the melody, I try to pick notes that belong to the chord that I'm on that fit below the melody. So keep the melody on top, figure out what the chord is, and then add those chord tones underneath the melody. Boom, you're harmonizing. So here, it was a C chord, right? And I'm playing the melody, which is G, and I'm adding the notes of the C chord below it. The next melody is C chord chord, and this is happening on an A minor. So if A is here, I'm gonna build that A triad underneath it. So an A triad is A, C, and E. So there's my E and there's my C. Ooh, I used a sus too in there. And then it can continue. And next is an F chord. Here's my F chord. There's my G chord. Ta -da. So it's like way easier said than done though. Because you have to be thinking about your chords, and then you have to be thinking about your melody, and then you have to know your chord inversion so that you can find those notes. Take some time and practice, but it gives you great motivation to do your triad practice. Yes. We all need to practice our triads. Okay. That was my little song that you can sing when you <laughs> need to be motivated. <laughs> I've had too much coffee. <laughs> okay. Back to the beautiful sounds. So let's talk about, I like this sound. We were talking about this earlier, so let's play around with this a little bit. One of the things I wanted to tell you is that in every key, so you could also refer to this as scale, major scale, so actually let's move to the key of G. Um, you think about your scale notes. One, two, back up Lisa. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, and G. Let's give each of those guys a number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the same as the one, so we'll call that the one. Now in popular music, we can build chords that sound really good together. And you, without fail, the chord that you build that starts on the one, the chord that you build when, that's, when you start on the four, Right, one, two, three, four. The one you build on the five. Remember, we've got F sharp because of the key signature. And the six. So the one, four, five, six. You can mix and match those chords in any order, and it's going to sound really good. There are other chords in the key, the diatonic chords, that are going to sound really good too. But if you're wanting to kind of play something that's kind of in line with popular music sounds, think about those chord tones. Think about the number system, and you are going to have everything that you need to play something beautiful. Really, truly. So let's take the shape I was doing earlier. So I did G, and then I found the fifth above G, which is D, and then I played the G on top. And I just am kind of putting a rhythm together for that. So as I talk, I change my pattern. Uh, this is what happens when you have to talk and play and think. Um, I'm gonna play the one, the five, that's not it. One, two, three, four, five. The one, the five, the six, and the four underneath this. Okay, there's the five. There's the six. And the four. Sounds good, right? There you go. Okay, 
So that's another really simple thing that you can do that's going to create beautiful sounds that you can explore and have lots of fun with. Um, and that was just one pattern that I'm playing in my right hand. I could pick any of the notes of the scale and I could create any pattern I wanted. Pick three or four notes and do the same thing with your left hand. Maybe you pick three or four notes and then do the pattern you did with the right hand with your left hand. So watch this. I'm going to play with um, this one and this one and those guys. Mm. Oh, one, five, six, four. What? One, two, three. Yeah. two notes. I'll have good posture. So all I've done is I've taken that pattern I was playing my right hand earlier, I've moved it to my left hand, and I've kind of explored a little bit and then settled on something that sounded good. And this is where I feel like songwriting can really begin because as you play around with improvising, you're going to hear things that you're like, oh, I really liked how that sounded in combination with this. And um, you can go back and repeat those things and develop themes and then put them together and rearrange them and create your own compositions that way, which is, isn't that super fun and awesome? Okay, I'm going to answer some more questions. Daniel, yes, I am holding the sustain pedal. Well, I'm not holding it constantly, but I always use it every single time I play the piano. I feel like at some point we all just do that. I don't know. Do you do that, Sam? Sam says thumbs up. Yeah. You bet. Sam does that. Once you just get confident with the pedal, you realize it makes everything sound richer and better, so you just use it. Okay. Tree can. You play any tree or tree can? Can you play any classical pieces? I sure can, but I'm not going to because I get really stressed out when I play classical pieces. Um. I practice classical music when I'm at home, um, but I just, there's just have to play them so precisely that I find it kind of, I don't know, overwhelming. Maybe one day I'll play a classical piece. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to a qu question from a member, from Robert. Could you demo that left hand steps down you like to do on the, and beat slowly? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. So this is, I think, in relation to something like, um, I think, and we could, hold on. There was a secret chord. Okay, I'll do it for hallelujah in the key of G. So anytime you are moving in a space of thirds with your chords, like, for example, if you're moving from a G, let's do this in root position. If you're moving from a G, to an E minor. There's only one note in between these guys. Now remember in the key of G we have an F sharp instead of a normal F. So we have an F sharp between where we are and where we're going. So what we can do is we can use that F sharp to carry us to that next chord that we're going to. So I'm gonna play how it'll sound and then I'll walk you through it really slowly. I heard there was a C And the next chord is C, actually. So we can do this little walk down wherever we want, especially when we have that space of a third. Four, five, six. Now, this doesn't really fall on the end because this is in six, eight time. So I might have to demonstrate this on a couple of songs for you. But if you break down the beat, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You can go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One. So it's on the very last beat um, that you can use that. I find that's probably where it sits best. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's how you lock that down. Now, if you were to do that in something with a different time signature, like um, let it be. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. So I walk
walk down with the C. One, yep. one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So that's what's happening on the and. Now I know I can do it. Because I'm moving from D minor to B flat. So just play this note in between. One and two and three and four and four. that helps. It's a great little tool that you can use to make your song sound more interesting. Okay. Okay, this is from William. Would you use open chord voicings if you were to sing simultaneously? What kind of voicing do you use? Yep, I would do like open chord voicings, like not having the center tone of the triad. Is that what that is? Um, okay, let's go back to Hallelujah. So, this is how I would go through it. I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do you? I find that it sounds a little bit bare on the open chords, um, eventually like I think you could maybe use that creatively if you are wanting to create like a more subtle sort of like intro or an out oh, end intro I just about said <laughs> that's a new one <laughs> or end intro um, but I think that it adds a lot to the chord when you add that center tone because then you know your ear can tell if it's major or minor it has like a an actual definition um, so that's what I have that's my thoughts on open chord voicings. I think they're really great too if you're just learning how to play trides and that forefinger gets in the way. Um, you can, this shape is much easier than this shape at the beginning, so there's no nothing wrong with that. When I'm teaching people at the beginning, especially with kids, is that's all I teach them. If you can get a kid to do that. Let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. Their life is made. They will they will love you and the piano forever. Just teach them some open chord voicings. <clears throat> okay. Oh, Thomas, what I just demonstrated a minute ago with those like walk downs, is basically that's passing chords. Well, passing notes. Same idea, I'm gonna say. Um, let me see what else I got here. Oh, we've got lots of questions on using the pedal. Holy Hannah. Okay, so Manuel, Dylan, Pal are all asking me about the pedal. Okay, is the QWERTY on the screen, Taylor? Okay. Okay, so guys, you see in the top left, it's left, right? Yeah. I just wonder if it was, never mind. Okay, left of the screen, <laughs> okay, there's something that says sustain on the MIDI overlay. Now it's green, now it's empty. Green, empty. So you can see when I'm pressing the pedal down. So that's gonna be helpful for you to kind of keep an eye on. Um, so when I use the sustain pedal, the main thing is to lift at every chord change. Lift and press. And then it sounds great. As soon as it starts to sound muddy, lift that pedal. Well, oh, that came up high. Lift that pedal. It's the coffee, guys. It's the coffee. Um, it, what? The pedal. Lift the pedal every time the sound is starting to get muddy. Now, as a beginner, this can be really hard to identify because you're thinking about what you're playing. So this is why a lot of times the pedal isn't introduced till a little bit later because you need to, like, learning a piano is so many things. You have to think and your hands have to cooperate together and your fingers have to move independent. It was, it's a lot. So when you add in one more thing that you have to coordinate, it's just extra. It's like riding a bicycle and juggling. And, and what's one more thing you could do while riding a bicycle and juggling? Having a snack? I don't know. Chewing gum. Chewing gum. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so be confident on the piano before you start to add in the pedal. All right, these guys are distracting me. Okay. 
to be fair, I feel like chewing gum is a fairly like brainless activity. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't imagine that takes no, any sort of effort. No, if you had to chew while you were juggling, Taylor, if you were juggling, you I would can, have to remember to chew because you take a break promise, from chewing. I can promise you if I knew how to juggle, I could chew gum at the same time. No, you have to think, <laughs> and pedal? I, I promise I could do it. Mm. How many likes are you going to have to get to do that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I have to spend time learning how to juggle and I feel like it's just not on my priority list, so, yeah. You see what I'm having to work with here, guys? Seriously. Okay, how do you know what chords sound good together? So that's kind of this whole concept of understanding um, diatonic chords, which is sort of like what we've been inadvertently exploring today. So let's just take a look at the diatonic chords for a minute because... This is a wonderful concept. So let's play in a new key. Let's play with D. So remember we talked about how important scales are. We're going to figure out the ingredients for the D scale. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and D. So we have two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. So when we're playing with this D scale, we can build chords. To figure out what chords belong in the key of D, we're going to make a triad. So a chord. I'm going to play the root note with my thumb, so D, and then F sharp, right, because this is part of the key signature, and then A. So this is the one chord in the key of D. Now I'm going to take this shape, and I'm going to just move it up one arch, keeping in mind all the notes that I can use as my ingredients, right? Um, so when I play my next chord, I'll remember that F is played as a sharp and C is played as a sharp. So here we go. We have an F sharp minor chord. We do this again on the next tone of the D scale. Right, one, two, three, four on our four chord now. Here's the five. Here's the six, which is a minor. And then this like diminished, crunchy one that I don't really like the sound of. And then we land back on where we started. So now we know in the key of D we have So, in my opinion, just forget that the, the seven exists. <laughs> Sam's going to be glaring at me. We don't need that one um, <laughs> for today. And mix and match any of those chords. See what happens. Let's start with our one, and then let's go to our three, and then our four. Oh, well, that, that sounds good. Let's go to our six, five, one. Well, I like that. So this is where you really get to dive in and explore how different chords sound together in combinations. You know that you're going to find ones that are complementary because you've figured out what chords belong in the key that you're playing in. Oof. It's a lot of information, but it will change your life. And then if you're practicing playing those diatonic chords in every key signature that you learn a scale in, you are going to learn every single chord in existence. Well, mostly. Except for some of like the other ones like... Sevens. But it's easy to get there from where you were. Mm, 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 mm. The best way to learn scales is to figure out the ingredients of that key and then play them. <laughs> play the scale. <laughs> Once you've figured out that, you know, D scale has F sharp and C sharp, play the scale the boring way, like with a metronome and practice it because that's important. And then, then play around with adding different notes that belong to that scale in the left hand. And that's how you make scale practice fun. Okay, so let me see. Um, we have like, honestly, a lot of lessons on how to take scales and all the creativity pieces and, and bring them together in the membership. So, you know, for me, when I was learning to play the piano, it was a traditional way. I was taught classically, and I just found it that I was disengaged and kind of bored. So, I don't know if you noticed, I have a bit of a short attention span. <laughs> so, I've worked really hard at developing lessons for our members that help to show creative ways that you can practice practical things so that you can actually really see how you can apply these technical skills in a musical way. Um, so we've got a lot of those lessons in our foundations learning path in the members area. We are releasing um, something called tech, Piano Technique Made Easy, shh, it's a secret, um, which teaches you like 
all the technique piano, like uh, for scales, chords, trides, chords and trides are the same, arpeggios, all the things that's coming soon. So there's a lot in the members area to help with that. Um, so you can just check out the link below to look at how that all works if you're interested in the membership. Um, and I'm going to ask some more questions. Ask some more questions. I was going to say answer some questions, but maybe I could ask a question. All right. What about tell me what your biggest struggle at the piano is? That's my question for you. I want to know what's the hardest thing for you when it comes to the piano. Is it like practice? Is it a specific concept? Is it um, your own self getting frustrated with progress? I don't know. That's probably mine. I just get frustrated when I'm like not where I want to be because I might be impatient. Okay, John Clark, seventh chords. Yes, I will talk to you, I'll talk to you about seventh chords because let me tell you, seventh chords were the worst for me forever because I didn't understand them and I'd see them on chord charts and I wouldn't play them because they were difficult. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna pull up a song here. I'm gonna use Desperado as an example in a minute. Um, okay, but here's the deal with seventh chords. If you can play a normal chord, you can play a seventh chord. So let's talk about this for a second. Okay, so in the key of C, you can build a C chord, right? C, E, G. So this is built of the first, third, and fifth note of the C scale. Now to play a, a seventh, the C major seventh, think of the C major scale and add the seventh note of the C major scale to the C major chord. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ta-da! You have a seventh chord. And you can play these four notes in any order you like. So if you have little hands and this is not feeling good for you, check this little hack out. You can play the triad with your two, three, five fingers. The seventh note is neighbors with the eighth note, so which is also the first note. So you can just do this half step below the root and you're playing a major seventh and it's warm and juicy and beautiful okay so that is a major seventh so let's go up to the relative minor and we'll play an a minor chord now so all you gotta do to play an a minor seven is add the seventh note of the minor scale one two three four five six seven it's so pretty so again, you can use that little hack where you play the root position chord with your two, your three, your five. And this time to add the minor seventh, it's not a half step down, it's a, it's a whole step. There's your minor seven. Also beautiful. Major seven, nine, did I do that right? Sometimes I have to think about what I'm doing. <laughs> minor seven. Okay, so there's one more kind of seventh that we'll talk about because it's pretty common and this is the dominant seventh. And these are shown, okay, so a major seven has the chord names like C and then M, A, J, and then seven. A minor seven has the chords, so like C, it's a little teeny M beside it, and then seven. And then a dominant seventh, which is like, I think the least obvious one, that one just has a seven beside it. And I think whoever made these rules needs to rethink their policy, because I would do it a little differently. But I'm not quite in a place where I could be changing the rules just yet. So dominant seventh chords. You take that seventh, okay, so let's pick a, a C major chord. We're gonna make it a C major seven. To make it a dominant seventh, you take this top guy and you lower him by a half step. That's what gives you that bluesy sound. That's a dominant seventh. So in a song like Desperado, this is a great song to practice because it has lots of sevenths. I'm trying to see if there's any major sevens in here. I don't think so. Minor sevens and dominant seventh. So and this is the contrast. So here's a C major, and then the dominant seventh sounds like that. So you get desperado, but right? I kind of messed that up. Let's try it again. Desperado. That dominant seventh tone makes this moment in the song. Why don't you come to your senses? You've been out riding fences. That A minor seven. so much more rich. That's my little speech on seventh chord uh, speech. Lise, can mm. you just uh, do me a quick favor and, and tell people why the dominant seven it belongs in a key, like on the no. fifth chord? You don't want to do that? No, I don't. Okay. That's okay. Sam's conversation. It's too deep of a question. It pulls to one. It pulls well, to well, the one. To me, it's because if, you, if, you, if the 
if the fifth was a major seven, then it would be outside the key signature. So you have to make it a dominant seven and lower it by a half step so it actually fits in the key signature. The key signature forces the flat seven. Which Boom. So, so Sam is saying the key signature forces the flat seven which in turn makes it a dominant seventh chord. So, okay, that's okay, I, I explained it. So this we're, we're is one right. of the moments where I'm just like, it's just this way because. Because I just don't, it's just not my jam. <laughs> I just don't like it. Because as soon as you start to talk about dominance, do you know what happens? Sam, what happens? It pulls down to the one. Well, it pulls down to the one, but I feel like <laughs> the whole like, concept of like the dominant is, I don't know. It's this big question. Sam's going to make a whole course on this in the piano members area. Isn't he? Yeah, yeah it's going to be super fun. We're all going to love it. Whoosh moment. <laughs> hey, I love singing and playing. That's the whole reason why I stuck with learning the piano, guys. Um, I like my bookshelf, too. Oh, this is a question that I like. What are some very bad habits a very new beginner should avoid? Sitting like this at the piano. See how I'm sitting and I'm playing like this? This is something you should not do. <laughs> Sometimes my parents would come upstairs and I'd be practicing like this. This is not a good way to practice. You should not get in this habit. This is the best way to play the piano. Otherwise, you'll be all grown up and on the worldwide internets playing the piano like this and your students will call you out on it and it'll be awful. That's one thing. Um, but on a more serious note, um, I forgot the question. Oh, beginner habits. <laughs> beginner habits. Okay. So on a more serious note, um, I think the good, the thing, hmm, turn that around. What things should a beginner focus on? I think that would be maybe a different way to phrase it. That kind of gives you like a really more, I don't know, like some exciting ideas. So I think beginners should focus on understanding that um, playing hands together is super hard and it's going to take a while and you got to go slow. Go slow. Can't stress that enough. Another thing a beginner should focus on is making sure that they understand timing and consistency, and that will mean some practice with a metronome. I don't like practicing with a metronome. It drives me absolutely bonkers, but it is so useful. So whether you use a drum track that you find on YouTube or you use a um, actual metronome, um, it's gonna help you to understand how to stay in time. So if you ever wanna play in a band or with other musicians, they will like you. Um, I mean, they might like you anyways, but it's more helpful if you can stay on time. And then the other thing is focus on learning um, how to play chords, because if you can play chords, you can play anything. Um, yeah, those are my main, those are my main things. We have some song requests rolling in. Sam, can you keep track of the song requests so that I can figure out which ones I, I know? Blackbird, Someone You Loved. That's so popular. Someone You Loved is like everybody's most favorite song. Okay, I'm getting off track because there's so many great questions. I don't know which ones to answer. <sighs> okay. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, from Aroha to he, a little more on the membership, please. Okay, so the membership is where you get all of the lessons. So we have the something called the Foundations Learning Path. It's 10 levels, there's 100 lessons, and there's guided practices for every lesson. So you'll be taken from having never played the piano to having you know, late, intermediate, early, advanced skills. Um, we also have a song library that's full of tutorials and lead sheets. We have weekly live q and A, so like what we're doing here, but in the members area, just for members. Um, so a lot of times people will be like, oh, I'd like to learn this song, and so I get a chord chart for them and you know, get them started or just answer any questions that come up. We do student reviews so people can take video of them playing and then send them to us, and then we will um, give some tips and suggestions for how to improve and what's going on with their playing. Um, and we have something called PAX. So the PAX section is really, really exciting because this is where we've got like 500 songs in five days, which is all on courting. We've got Faster Fingers, which is about how to play faster. It's a 10 minute a day program, it's amazing. And we have Say Reading Made Simple. So um, that's happening in a bundle right now. So if you don't wanna to commit to like the monthly membership, you can bundle, you can get all three of those packs, like Lifetime Access Forever and Ever. How um, what is it for? Ah, $97. So you get lots of lessons. That will basically set you up for lots of success at the piano. Um, for, for just $97, which is pretty awesome. Um, so that's one thing you can do. The other thing is you can just have your, your membership. Um, you can do that yearly or monthly, I believe. 
and that would include the bundles and um, all those other features I was talking about. So basically, it's pretty awesome. If you want to learn how to play the piano and you want some support, you don't want to just like kind of be thrown into just online lessons, you want a little more of a personal touch, membership's pretty awesome. From Amika, did I say that right? Aw, I just wanted to say I'm your biggest fan and you inspired me to start playing the piano. In a hard time in my life, you press that and alone, but your music methods helped me. That makes me so happy. Ah, the piano is such a, I don't know, I think it's a great place to kind of escape, to express. There's a lot of science to um, back up the idea that um, learning the piano can just have so many positive effects on our mental health. And I was actually listening to a, a doctor speaking the other day, and he was talking about how important it is to engage in play um, as adults to help us to like get our emotions out and in order because we have to do that to be healthy and he talked about how music is one of the most effective ways to do that so even if you've never played the piano before and you can figure out how to you know just play some pretty sounds um you're doing wonders for yourself so there you go we have song requests okay i'm gonna do <laughs> looks like i'm doing someone you loved all right guess what we have a tutorial for this one too on our youtube channel and in the members area. I don't know if this is gonna be the right key, hold on. Going under in this time I feel there's no one to turn to. Hmm. That's a little low, so let me just take it into a different key. Someone you loved. I think I do this one in F. It's possible. C? Go on. No, not C. Let's try F. Okay. beginner could play someone you loved um actually let me just convert this to C for a second if you want to play this and you're a total beginner and you've never played the piano before watch this you can get away with doing this so I'm just rocking back and forth here on CNG But, right? Do that right away. First lesson. Blackbird. Oh, that's another good one. I do Blackbird. Oh, uh, maybe not. Oh, I don't know. I've never done Blackbird before. Oh, well, I've tried to do Blackbird. Blackbird's tricky. You want to see me fail, my friends? Isn't Blackbird like super guitar heavy and like all picking. Yep. Yeah. Let's see what I can do with it. Hold on. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. That's too. Let's see. Ooh. Mm. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these. Oh heavens. Broke. Nope. G flat. G flat. G flat. F sharp. Broken wings and learn to fly. Okay, we're gonna have a moment where we talk about diminished chords, because these are the one chord that I'll still avoid on a chart. Sam's smiling at me. 
funnily right now. He's like, <laughs> they're fine. They're fine. Okay, so I don't love them. I've been practicing um, Someone Saved My Life Tonight by Elton John because it has a bunch of diminished chords. I'm trying to get better at them, but this one throws me because it's a G flat diminished, which I don't know. There's something about G flat that just messes me up. So a diminished chord. All it is is a stack of minor thirds. So you literally need to find the note of the chord, so G flat in the song, in the key I've chosen, and then you make a stack of minor thirds, which is just three half steps. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. That would be considered a G flat diminished. Uh, right? So take these broken wings and learn to fly. I feel like that chord is super wrong. Oh, oh there's that diminished again. Your life. with that today but I could spend some time with it and maybe make friends with that song I actually love Sarah McLaughlin's cover of it it's so beautiful but to all of you you diehard Beatles fans I also love that version so much um give me just a moment here mm -hmm. Tony I'd love to demonstrate some of the voicings or like sounds on this piano but I don't I think they're there's just pianos. Triple large. I like this one. B concert grand. I'm gonna stick with that. Oh my gosh, it's been an hour. Don't forget to turn it back. I turned it back. Taylor, it's okay. I turned it back. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I'm gonna have to go soon, my friends. So. I want to answer this question from Becca. How can I get myself to practice more? I want to get to an intermediate level, yet I need to spend time on the right things. It's all in how you structure your practices. So you have to understand the difference between practicing and playing. Practicing is like doing the hard stuff where you're developing the skills and it's not as fun as playing. Playing is when you're just playing. So every practice has practice in playing. <laughs> so what I mean by that is you're going to warm up you're going to work on your foundational skills, building the hard stuff where, you know, you stop and you pause and you repeat and you do the work. And then at the end of that period of time, you reward yourself by playing and doing something you really enjoy, whether that be improvising or playing a song that you love and have really a lot of confidence on already. And that's how you end your practices, on this positive note, so that your body, then you check in with your body after you're done. You go, how do I feel right now? This is really important. You ask yourself, how do I feel? Because you're going to feel great. Because nobody ever said, oh, I really wish I hadn't practiced piano today. You're going to feel great. And if you take a couple minutes to feel and reflect on that greatness, when you think about practicing, your body will remember that good feeling. Um, it's, so it's about building the habit, kind of like exercise. It does take a little bit of convincing. We have to talk ourselves into it. Um, but it can be done. Um, and the other piece of that is just staying connected to your passion. So when you're like, I don't want to practice, we all, we all do it. Um, you can ask yourself the question, why did I start learning to play the piano to begin with? And if you can remember that, then you'll probably be like, oh yeah, because I wanted to do this. Well, then I better go practice. Mm, whoa, so many, que so many questions are happening. Play creep. Oh, I could end with creep because we just did a tutorial for that in the members area. Okay, I'm going to sing us out with creep because that will be fun. Is that what we should do? Okay, let's do creep. I will not sing any swears if there are kids present, just so you know. I will replace them with other words. Oh, I'm just finding my sheet for creep. So if you like this song, it's in the members area for piano. I'll teach you how to play it in there. Oh my goodness, I haven't done this one in a while. So I'm gonna say goodbye now because I'm just gonna sing and then it's probably gonna disappear, right, Taylor? Yeah, probably, yeah. That's probably how it works. Okay. Thank you for hanging out. <clears throat> Okay, how does this go? Okay, I remember now. <laughs> you were here before. Gonna look you in the eye. You're 
just like an angel.